Hello, this is Brennan B. Fish. In another world, I'm kind of known as, well, Jeff, uh, not George R. R. Martin, sorry about that. Uh, this is the first video I've ever done on YouTube, so I figured I would do it correctly by having my dog beneath me. You can't see him, he's out of frame, but you'll hear him shaking around a little bit, as well as to have a beer in hand when I'm talking. So uh, this beer is uh, Sierra Nevada Ultra Vase. Um, it's not very good. I just wanted to get because I wanted to try it and it looked tasty and I had never tried it before. Kind of a mistake. Don't buy this beer. This channel is not sponsored by Sierra Nevada. So I wanted to start today by talking about a hero. A hero from a dance with dragons who leads his people to, to greatness, is a heroic character, and then is tragically cut down at the end. But this hero is not returning in The Winds of Winter or beyond. I'm not talking about Jon Snow. No, not Jon Snow. Daenerys Targaryen. No, I'm not talking about her either. I'm talking about Quentin fucking Martell. Quentin Martell is the most heroic character in A Song of Ice and Fire, period. Quentin Martell is a personal hero of mine, uh, but more than that, he speaks to elements of the hero's journey. The hero's journey being the start to finish of a man goes on a quest, and at the end he gets a, a his reward or whatnot. Except for in this case, George R. R. Martin decided that Quentin Martell was not going to get a hero's reward. In fact, Quentin Martell would have a very realistic hero's journey. Now, I could go through the entire hero's journey, and that could be a four-hour-long talk. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do instead is that I'm going to talk about why Quentin Martell is dead. Like, so dead. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is that it speaks to all the themes in there. There's a lot of folks in the Song of Ice and Fire community which say, oh, Quentin Martell is not dead, he survives, he's going to live on in the winds of winter. But no, he's not going to be living on in the winds of winter. And there's a major reason for that. Quentin Martell's arc, his narrative arc in A Dance with Dragons was perfect. And the concluding portion of his arc was just brilliant. Well, not brilliant. I mean, you don't like to see the guy die, but at the same time, you realize, well, you know, he kind of got the, the what was coming to him. Not what was coming to him in terms of, like, he deserved it, but he it was, a, it was a narrative conclusion that was successful on Martin's part when he wrote it. Where to begin? Okay. I'm not going to present point by point why Quentin Martell is dead from the, from the text or the plot. Instead, I'm going to talk about why Quentin Martell is almost, is not almost certainly, he is, oh, he is certainly dead. He is beyond a belief dead. And I'm going to talk about that out of the narrative from A Dance with Dragons. So to start off with, Quentin's arc in A Dance with Dragons begins with Adventure Stank. It's kind of a pun because he's traveling on the ship known as Adventure uh, to, to Volantis, and he's, he's, it stinks, but it's also the fitting start of his arc and how his arc progresses throughout A Dance with Dragons. Um, we find out Quentin's journey in A Feast for Crows from Arianne's chapter. Arianne spends her entire arc thinking that Quentin is going to use her, her seat for, uh, for Dorne. She, he's going to become the Prince of Dorne, that Doran Rattel has set her aside secretly. Instead, we find out that, no, he's actually on his way to Marine to meet up with Daenerys Targaryen in order to wed her, in order to bring Daenerys and her dragons to Dorne to win the Iron Throne and get revenge for all the crimes that they commit against the Dorch, which are a fucking lot. So, we start off with Adventure Stank, and his arc progresses from there. His arc is all about the turns that an, a true adventure takes in the story. We, we hear in Volantis that he gets to Volantis, and he has no fucking way to get to Marine. So he's in, he's trying to, he's in the Sporn City, he doesn't know anything, and suddenly he gets a idea pressed on him by some seltzers nearby from the Windblown. And the Windblown say, we will march to Marine, and they sing these bawdy uh, sellsword songs. And that's where Quentin Martell starts his arc. He starts his kind of fall, his turn, his twist towards becoming a true hero. And a true hero in terms of like a realistic fucking rational hero. So he's a realistic hero. And then he's in Volantis, and he lets, he heads out with the wind blowing, he sails to, to Yunkai, and he joins up with the Yunkish, and he starts to fight with them, and he fights this horrible battle at Astapor. You know, he says in his second chapter, the Red City was the closest thing to hell he had ever hoped to know. The Yunkai had sealed the broken gates to keep the dead and dying inside the city. 
but the sights he had been seen riding down those red brick streets would haunt Quentin Martel forever. You know, and, and George R. Martin goes on to describe a, a very Holocaust-like scene in Astapor as bodies are burning and people are dying left and right, and Quentin Martel participates in that slaughter. He raises his sword up and down on these defenseless men who are running from the battle. Um, Cleon's uh, fake unsullied, I think, is the ones that he kills. He just... He, this is the first act of his adventure's quest, and he rolls through it, and he's really changed by it. He's haunted by it. It's the closest thing he ever knew to hell. But he kills boys. He kills men. He kills people who are fleeing. He kills noncombatants in the battle. That's kind of how the adventure story starts for Quentin Martell. When Quentin Martell finally comes up to Marine, he then is told by the uh, windblown, by the tattered prince, that he is, because he's Westerosi and he's Dornish, he is to turn cloak on... The, uh, the windblown, you know, quote unquote, turn cloak on the windblown, and then join up with Marine in order to ascertain Daenerys Targaryen and whether she is someone that is worth switching and turning cloak towards. So Quentin Martell turns his cloak. He takes another step towards in the adventure's quest, but a realistic one where he has to compromise himself. He compromises himself by killing innocents in Astapor. He then compromises himself further, at least in his own mind, of compromising himself by betraying his oaths, or being a turncloak, or being a secret spy or agent for the Tattered Prince. Now, in Marine, Quentin Martell comes to discover to his horror that his entire journey is sort of a fool's quest, because he arrives the day before Daenerys Targaryen is set to wed um, in Marine itself. And she's not wedding Quentin Martell, she's wedding... Um, This is where a lot where ranting kind of comes to uh, to a, to a fault. His stars, oh Lord, there we go. I'm not even looking at my notes. I'm just kind of guessing, pulling things out of my head. Um, he's she's set to wed his stars, oh Lord, at the expense of Quentin, and Quentin tries desperately to convince her. He shows her the letter from um, from long ago, stating that it was Oberyn Martell who witnessed the Sea Lords pack in Bravos between Daenerys and uh, and uh, excuse me, originally Viserys and Arianne. And with the hopes that then Daenerys would fulfill her part of the bargain. But Daenerys, you know, kind of rightfully says, you know, no fucking way. You know, I'm already set to be wed. I've encountered all these problems in my own arc. It's not really much of a hero's arc. It's kind of a different thing that George does. And I'll, maybe I'll talk about it in a future video. But essentially, he's, uh, he's spurned. He's spurned. Daenerys Targaryen says no, tries to let him down nicely. But at the same time, uh, it's really um, kind of devastating for Quentin. And so Quentin is still a Marine when events from uh, the end of A Dance of Dragons happens where Daenerys Targaryen flies off on Drogon. But he gets he hatches this plan in his mind. He hatches this plan. He says, oh, well, I, I, if I go home without any dragons or without Daenerys Targaryen, then I will be laughed at by, by the Sand Snakes. And that Doran Martell would understand, but he would be upset at his son. He would be disappointed. And he hatches this really damn fool plan, which is to steal a dragon. So he decides, I'm going to steal a dragon, I'm going to um, sneak into one of the pyramids, and I'm going to steal a dragon's. And he says, quote, you know, the dragon has three heads, she said to me. My marriage need not be the end of all your hopes, I, she said. I know why you're here, for fire and blood. I have Targaryen blood in me. You know that. I can trace my lineage back. He hashes this plot, he goes back to the windblown, who he sends... He's betrayed the windblown at this point. Didn't really cover that previously, but he's betrayed the windblown. He goes back to the windblown and says, oh, I have this plot. I'm going to um, steal a dragon. I need your guys' help. And, you know, he says, what's your price? And the Tatter Prince says, I don't want your gold. I don't want anything like that. You know, what I want is Pentos. And the Tatter Prince is a fucking son of a bitch. And he is a terrible human being. But Quentin Martell further compromises by making this deal with... Um, with Quentin, excuse me, with the Tattered Prince. So it's really bad, but it's also very realistic. Quentin is on a, a journey. He's at the apex of his journey, seemingly. But the thing is, is that Martin then uses that as a deconstruction of the fairy tale. Because what happens? What happens to Quentin at the end of his last chapter? They roll into the, uh, the pyramid. They try and steal a dragon. Quentin Martell... Um, and they commit all these terrible things. They kill a bunch of people that they didn't mean to kill. And he, the cell sores are killing people left and right. Um, and it's terrible. It's, it's horrible for Quentin. He's, he's 
seeing his hero's journey in a really terrible light. So what happens at the end of him? It's just an, it's a natural arc. He tries to steal a dragon, and the dragon either tricks him or re rejects him. It's really un unclear in the text what's what's going on in the dragon's mind. Well, I don't think you really get inside of a dragon's mind ever. Um, but he's lit on fire by one of the dragons. One of the dragons like attacks him, lights him on fire, and his whole arm is burning. And he says, "Oh," and that's his last his last thing that the hero said. Um, very sad, and it's also an arc that people don't really gravitate towards. They really don't get why Quentin died. And the major reason why is that George R. R. Martin, in constructing Quentin's arc, is deconstructing the fairy tale. He's basically saying the same thing that he said to Sansa in A Game of Thrones and A Clash of Kings, that life is not a song. You know, uh, Quentin Martell thinks the most beautiful world, woman in the world is waits me and I'm going to go save her and I'm Dorne and she will want Dorne. And all these things that are really kind of um, fantastical, to, to, for lack of a better term, it's, they're not realistic at all. But he thinks that because he is the hero of his story that he is going to um, be the person that's going to accomplish all these things. But here's the, the point of it. Is, and it's something that Garris Drinkwater says. He says to Quentin, men die on grand adventures. Men die on grand adventures. That's a huge point. That's what sort of the big thing that Martin is saying here. He's kind of deconstructing that story of the hero going from uh, humble beginnings of being the humble kind of ugly prince. You know, Quentin is described as being very average, if not sort of ugly, in the story, to, you know, he, he hopes that he could be Prince Frog, you know, the prince... Princess kisses the frog, and, and she is he becomes the beautiful or the handsome prince, rather, and they live happily ever after. But men die on grand adventures. That's the big thing, is that men fucking die on grand adventures. And that's the point that Martin wants to push to you. That's the thematic side. On the narrative side, the major reason why Quentin has to fucking die is because Dorne sent mud, that is Quentin, to Daenerys, and Daenerys will bring fire to Dorne. The major thing about Quentin Martell is that he is now at the position where his death then reverberates throughout many, many arcs in A Song of Ice and Fire, in The Winds of Winter and beyond, but especially, most poignantly, in Dorne. Dorne right now, at the start of The Winds of Winter, and yes, spoilers for The Winds of Winter, is on the cusp of supporting Aegon, Tar the supposed son of Rhaegar Targaryen. Uh, I don't think he's the supposed son of Rhaegar Targaryen. Yeah, I don't think he's the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, but, you know, uh, not here to talk about that particular point right now. But he is supposed to, Quentin is supposed to bring Daenerys back and then unite Dorne and the Targaryens together. Instead, Quentin's death at the hands of a dragon after he's been rejected by Daenerys Targaryen and a horrible, terrible, awful death then ignites a powder cake which then pushes the plot forward so that Dorne is saying, you know what, we're not going to be so hot on Daenerys Targaryen. I have a daughter in Arianne. She can marry Aegon, and we can achieve our vengeance that way. Because Dorne Martell is looking for vengeance, but he's trying to do it, you know, smartly. I mean, he's a fucking dumbass. But besides that, he's trying to achieve his vengeance, and he needs a vehicle to take him to that vengeance. And that vehicle, he thinks, is Daenerys Targaryen. However, Daenerys Targaryen is a marine. Quentin is dead. Aegon is left. Um, Arianne is still alive. He has another son that he can, and Tris, Tristane, that he can marry, that he can become the Prince of Dorne, but he can have his daughter become the Queen of Westeros with uh, a bride in, or excuse me, a husband in, in Aegon. Um, that's really something that is worth uh, talking about quite a bit. You know, it's, it's really kind of something that, you know, Martin has structured it thematically and narratively to talk about why Quentin has to die. Now, I could talk about things like the plot points, like that Quentin's whole arm is on fucking fire at the end of this chapter. I could talk about, you know, that the next line in Barristan's point of view is that the prince was three days dying. But that's not as important as the narrative and thematic reasons for why Quentin Martell is fucking dead. So, Quentin Martell is dead. Like, so dead. Thanks for watching. Oh, and you know, if you have a comment or a concern or a way to improve this, let me know. I'm running sort of out of time here, and this is my rant. And Yolk Boy, this one goes out to you. See ya.